Ok, muy buenas tardes a todos los que nos han acompañado. Good afternoon to everybody, those that have accompanied us in their first three days, what we call the Bird Life Day on the World Migratory Bird Day with our new conservation topic, Protect the Insects, Protect the Birds. And to begin with this, we always like to thank our sponsors. Um, each day make it possible that this World Migratory Birthday is able to develop a spirit educational events in all of the countries around the world, especially in the Americas, from Canada all the way to the South. Those from the Forest Service and the National Park Service are partners that allow us and help us to produce materials and be distributed in different languages, like English, Spanish, French and Portuguese. Those educators that are celebrating and highlighting the World Migratory Birthday have the possibility to enter a sweepstakes to win these binoculars. This also allows them to provide the same materials to educators and people involved that support our work. We also have the CERSA Society, who, which is the entomologic uh, society biggest in the Americas. We also have our supports and sponsors in every corner of the world that allow us to multiply the voices on the World Migratory Birthday. If you want to support us, please go ahead and contact us and we will be more than happy to receive your support and redirect it to all the educators that we have in order to produce conservation for birds and also the protection of their habitats. This is how I want to go ahead and welcome and tell everybody in general that the next presentation will be mainly in English, but we have interpretation live from English into Spanish, where you will be able to add and join the interpretation services for you so that you can access where our compañera Mayra is helping us. Without further ado, I want to also welcome the director, Susan Bonfield, who is going to be presenting the team that will be speaking this afternoon, and our coordinator, Karina Avila, who is also going to share with us in Portuguese what is going to be happening today. Go ahead, Karina. I'm really excited about the presentation today. I'm Susan Bonfield. I'm the Director of Environment for the Americas, and welcome to our special presentations in celebration of World Migratory Bird Day. This is um, our peak time of year, though we encourage everybody to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day when it's best for them. But uh, we are celebrating under the slogan, protect insects, protect birds. And today we have an amazing story to tell about Purple Martins. And so we have two wonderful people here, Deanna Williams, who is with the US Forest Service, and Cla Clarissa, um, who is working on Purple Martins in, um, in Brazil. And their story connects us across borders, uh, which is an, a story of long distance migration, of dependence on insects to make these migrations and of how communities need to work together to protect birds. And so first I'd like to um, invite Deanna Williams on with me to say hello. So if maybe if we could Hi, spotlight Deanna at the same time. Hey Deanna, it's so good to see you this morning. Deanna's work on Purple Martins begins in Oregon and I'm gonna turn it over to you to tell the story about Purple Martins in Oregon, and then we'll go to Brazil. Thank you so awesome. much. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me to give this presentation. It, it is um, 
a great story. It's a great mystery. And um, it is a great uh, connection between two uh, communities and coasts um, that uh, were excited to join. So I'm going to share my screen. Tell me when it's caught up. You are alive. Okay. And um, can you guys see this? I'm yes, not sure how to make this go. Yes, you are on your own slide with Clarissa. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's okay. good. It's good. Okay. All right. So. Um, yes. Uh, so my name is Deanna Williams. I am the uh, wildlife program lead for the Saisla National Forest. And um, we are working with Purple Martins um, here on the west coast of Oregon um, because they're generally uh, considered to be declining at a fairly rapid rate. The kind of cool thing about the purple martins here on the west coast is that unlike uh, the e their east coast cousins, they actually still nest in natural cavities, um, which is pretty unique. And um, they also take advantage of a lot of really abundant insects to, to feed their, their chicks. Um, but due to their uh, their rate of decline, we in the Forest Service have been concerned about them and we've started to do a lot of um, habitat improvement projects, trying to figure out how can we turn around this, this decline and, um, and figure out what's going on. Now, like I said, uh, purple martins here on the West Coast, they tend to nest in natural cavities, but they also really like open areas. And so you might think that logging uh, could benefit uh, purple martins if we just make sure that they have cavities available, but they're still declining. And we can't really quite figure out what's going on with that. And so there's lots of thoughts out there. Um, are we not providing the right kind of cavities? Is it not in the right spot? Uh, we're developing at a you know unprecedented rate and converting natural habitats into uh, human habitation. Um, then, of course, we are all here today because we're concerned about insects, and we know that insects are declining. And in addition to um, when we cut forests, oftentimes we spray the forest to give the trees that are growing an advantage, um, killing all the pests that might prey on those trees and any competing vegetation. So um, both in a forested environment and in our home environment, is it something like the chemical accumulation of all these chemicals? Or is it just a combination of all of the above? Um, and are there other factors that we just don't know? And it's this last one that really kind of got me thinking, because there's actually a lot about the Purple Martins on the West Coast that we don't know. Um, and so... I kind of wanted to see if I could start to to solve some of these these mysteries. And um, so just for a little bit of context, uh, North America, this is the state of Oregon. Um, my forest is right on the coast. Um, and we have uh, our motto is from the forest floor to the ocean shore. Um, and you can see that this is um, a picture of uh, a beach where we have forest, we have all of this wonderful water, fresh water uh, that produces a lot of insects, and we have a lot of open area for the purple martins to hunt over. And this is a beach where we have actually a lot of purple martins um, nesting and uh, feeding. So we would think that here on the Oregon coast, especially on the Saisla National Forest, we would have everything that the purple martins need but they're still declining. And so again, that mystery is, well, they really only spend five months of the year breeding here on the Oregon coast. So what do they do and where do they go for the other seven months of the year? And how can our actions here in Oregon um, accumulate and connect to actions throughout the rest of the areas? Well, the interesting part is actually nobody knew. 
back in the early 2000s, we put a little tracker on a couple of birds from British Columbia um, up in here. And we got some lat long, um, some latitudes. So we know that our birds here on the West Coast do go down to Brazil, but we didn't know what path they took. We didn't know um, where they stopped over and we didn't know their final destination. So all of these things are mysteries that if we here in Oregon are going to help conserve and understand the, the factors that are causing our birds to continue to decline, we have to understand um, what's going on uh, throughout the rest of their range. So we uh, decided to do to use modern technology to help solve this ancient mystery because again, here in Oregon, we know that these birds show up every April without fail, late late April, early May. And down in Brazil in the southern latitudes, they probably know that the purple martins show up at some point in time down there too, but nobody knows what they do in the middle. And nobody knows, we don't know where our birds in Oregon go and the people in Brazil don't know where their birds go when they leave Brazil. So we actually used um, a GPS technology. So these are little GPS trackers. You can see here on the bird for scale, what they look like. This is the antenna, it's kind of hard to see but they're quite small. And we put these um, tiny little GPS trackers on uh, purple martins here on the coast. And um, we found out some really, really fascinating stuff that is no one had guessed, no one anticipated. And I'm here to share some of that great, uh, exciting discoveries with you. So again, uh, we have these individual green lines all represent different individual birds. Um, we're starting here in Oregon on the coast, uh, one from the Willamette Valley. And we, when we got the, the birds back and the data back, these are the general paths that they took. But here is something absolutely fascinating that no one knew before. They didn't just make a straight shot to their, to, uh, to their southern grounds. They actually stopped off over the Gulf of California for over a month in uh, for the month of September. And we hadn't really thought about that before, that they might stop and actually dine for a full month and get fat to help them on, on, their, uh, on their migration. But here's another fascinating mystery that we discovered when, when we had this GPS information that where they were stopping around the Gulf of California here, over here, up here, and um, on Baja, was actually a Western Hemisphere shorebird reserve network. And what we discovered is that the birds that we tagged in Oregon um, actually shared beaches in Mexico with shorebirds from our beaches in Oregon that were also banded and tagged. And so this connection that the birds in Oregon hung out together and ate insects. Uh, shorebirds picked the insects out of the ground and purple martins picked the insects out of the air, um, but they liked the same places. And that again, to us was thinking in three dimensions, not just thinking about insects on the ground, not just thinking about insects in the air, but thinking about both dimensions and how conservation action can benefit um, all these species. So, but then where did they go from there? After they dined for a month in over the Gulf of California, um, again, the question was, we knew they kind of went somewhere near Brazil. This red circle indicates uh, where a lot of the Eastern purple martins go in the winter. Well, our purple martins got close, but they just passed them on by. And that was shocking to us. Like we really thought that they would come down and just hang a left and hang out with their Eastern cousins. Cause obviously their Eastern cousins thinks that the Amazon basin is a pretty great place to spend quite a few months out of the year. So if they're not joining their Eastern cousins, where are they going? Well, what they showed us is they wanted to come all the way down back to the coast. And so here is a close up of where our birds spent this time um, when this is they showed up in late November, December. They spent 
December all the way up through April. Um, unfortunately, our, our batteries and our tags died at that point. So that's the, the, the end of our information. Um, but it just opened up all of these doors and all of these and it answered a bunch of questions and it brought up even more questions. But one thing we know for sure is these particular birds love aerial insects near the coast from the Oregon coast to the Gulf of California to the coast of uh, southeastern Brazil. They love dining on insects bathed in fresh salty air. So the other cool thing that we discovered is that look at these towns, look at the connection that these birds have brought us. This is a town where we had tagged birds in Oregon and this is the town where they spent the winter um, or our North American winter in Brazil. There's a lot of similarities between these towns. And before we had this data, we had no idea that our towns were connected through nature. Um, but what was really interesting is that even though we are or through discovering these um, connections, we're discovering that there's even more mysteries to be solved. Are the shorebirds from North America coming down here? And when we got down here, there was a lot of purple martins, but we don't know where they're all from. Are they all from Oregon? Are some from other parts of the world? We just don't know. So one of the main things that we figured out is that all of the birds that we tagged in Oregon loved this little town in Brazil called Linares. And so we connected with uh, Clarissa Santos and um, the work that she was doing down in Purple on um, Purple Martins down in this area of the world. And she was able to get to this town and discover um, the answers to some of our mysteries. And once again, even more mysteries and more questions. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Clarissa. So thank you, Deanna. I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. I know you have a super busy schedule and you fit us in. Do you have any time for any questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, I have a few minutes if if we sure. want to do that before Clarissa goes. Okay, that'd be great. And then Clarissa can get ready for her presentation. We'll have her pull up a separate slide presentation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about in Oregon, maybe some ways that people can help Purple Martins or anything that they can do at their homes or in their communities that would benefit Purple Martins? Yeah, so I think that um, one of the big things that is to per make sure when, when you have trees that have, um, uh, and you're thinking about cutting them down because they have a little bit of rot or maybe they have a few holes in them, if they're in a safe place, um, maybe consider leaving them up or providing a home for these birds. Um, you know, oftentimes when we get trees that are dying or rotten, uh, we want to take them down immediately because uh, they form a hazard to humans. And that is very true. But sometimes they're in a safe place and leaving those trees up to provide homes is is really important. Um, another thing that people can do that's really simple on the outside, I know it can be complex. I have a small farm, I have a garden, and sometimes it seems we're besieged with insect and plant pests. But if there's ways, you know, there's lots of resources available to not completely eliminate, but to reduce the amount of chemicals you use in your yard and to find ways to live with beneficial insects. Um, reducing that chemical load uh, and providing more, allowing more beneficial insects to thrive and help letting the purple martins help us with that insect load um, would be an absolutely great thing to do. Thank you. And and just a, a, a curiosity question, which I'm not sure if you can answer or not, or if we have these kinds of data, um, what kind of insects are they capturing in the air? Do, do we know that? Yeah, so we don't have a whole lot of information. We do know that they feed at elevations in the air much higher than a lot of other swallows and aerial flycatchers. Um, so we don't have a lot of samples up there. But the one thing we do know is possibly because they love open water. Um, one of their favorite foods to feed to growing chicks is uh, dragonflies. 
And so it's just a great connection. We know that dragonflies, you know, prey on other insects. And that's one of the reasons why chemicals can be um, so damaging to purple martins. It's uh, something called bioaccumulation. And if we spray the small insects and dragonflies eat the small insects, the chemicals bioaccumulate in dragonflies. And then when purple martins eat those dragonflies, it bioaccumulates in them as well. And they feed those to their babies. Um, so we don't have all the answers, but we do know that dragonflies are a particular tasty treat for growing young uh, purple martins. Thank you. It's fascinating work. And thank you again for making time in your day to join us. And with that, yeah, I'll thank you. Clarissa. Okay. Thank you, Deanna. So Clarissa will bring us news from Brazil and I'll turn it over to you, Clarissa. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Clarissa. I'm from University of Sao Paulo where I'm a PhD student and I'm also working in Instituto Butantã where I'm part of the Projeto Andorinha Azul which is the conservation project for the purple markings here in Brazil. In my PhD, I, stu I study exactly what Deanna was talking about, about bioaccumulation of mercury on purple markings and the mercury exposure that they face here in Brazil. I'm analyzing the feathers of the of purple markings that either we capture here in Brazil or feathers that I collect from the US because the feathers grow here in Brazil, so it accumulates the toxicants and hormones uh, that that was accumulated during the growth of the feather here during the non-breeding season. But today I'm gonna speak about more general aspects about purple martin migrations and the environment that they uh, encounter here in Brazil. So first, I'm gonna uh, continue from where Deanna left. Then I got a few steps back to explain more general aspects about the species and its declines. Well, so as Deanna was saying, uh, the purple martins from Oregon came to this little town in the state of Spiritu Santo called Linhares which it's a mixture mixed of landscapes and we have a lot of crops forest and the beach obviously and this is the context of a uh, purple martin roost in Linhares they roost they use the trees uh along of in the sidewalk of a road it's a federal road that crossed the city. So we have uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of cars, a lot of trucks, and a lot of people. And this is the place that we can see them in Linhares. And this year, we were able to conduct a field season there. It was quite challenged to capture birds. <laughs> in such a high uh, such a high elevation that flies so high and in such a urban place with a lot of people passing through but we were able to capture them here's a a video of us capture some of them while they were left in the trees <laughs> and we were able to capture 65 purple martins between others other marching species that occur also in Brazil and flock together. And we collect a lot of samples for my PhD and for other projects like blood, um, the feathers, um, we took measurements and we also banded them with the federal Brazilian band and with color band. So if any of the guys in the US see purple markings with red, greens, or orange band, you can take a picture and send it to us, please. And sorry. Oh, oh sorry. 
Pacific Network. And this is the landscape in Linares. Although the purple martins roost in this urban area that you can see here, during the day, they are records uh, about 30 kilometers from the urban area in this little village called Regencia that you can see on the right. Uh, and we also, besides the field work, we also monitor citizen site records, uh, which is an example here that it's a picture took from a bird watching, bird watcher in Regencia. And you're going to see through my presentation that they are, as they are in Oregon and as they are here and in other places, they are uh, closely related with water because it's where they feed themselves. So in Regencia, uh, there's this huge river that you see here and some forests. And it's a very different environment environment that they that the place that they roost and uh, also another place that the Oregon researchers found to be a non-breeding area of the purple martins from there it's Guarapari which it's a little bit south than Linares uh, Rocha which is the name of the first female purple martin that has been tracked from Oregon, spent two weeks there during the carnival. <laughs> and this year we also visit there. We weren't able to conduct the, to capture or collect any sample, but we were able to appreciate this amazing spectacle. Expecto. They, this was during the morning where, when they were leaving the trees. The, you can see it's a different type of environment because it's right uh, side of the beach. But as you can see, there's a lot of buildings behind here. So it's also a very urban space. So now backing uh, a little bit to present uh, some general aspects about the, the species. Uh, this decline that is observed between insectors, in, insects due to the climate effects and anthropogenic actions, it's an alarming issue because this diverse group sustain directly or indirectly sustain all the biodiversity, inclu including the purple margins, which uh, feed from them and exclusive feeds from on insects. And together with its decline, we see a decline of purple martins from the last 50, uh, 55 years. The species has a decrease in number by 24.1%. And this decline is observed in various uh, insectivorous species and it's even more pronounced among migratory insectivorous birds because uh, in addition to dealing with the re reduce of food availability, they face a range of challenges during their, their annual cycle uh, involving survival across, surviving across various landscapes and environments. So this is the annual cycle of the purple martins. They breed in the, in the North America, uh, in Canada, US, and part of Mexico during the spring and uh, the summer there. And they migrate to South America, mainly in Brazil, during our spring and our summer, which is, oh, which is between September in March, uh, beginning of April. As we, we talk about one of the three purple martin subspecies, but there's other two. So it is recognized three subspecies of purple martins, which is like a subdivision of a species 
uh, they have some morphological difference, uh, distribution difference. I think it's the most the the most noticed, the easiest notice difference, and also some behavior differences, um, mainly uh, in the breeding. And because of this behavior differences, we also have different informations about each one of them. The state of knowledge about each one of them is different. And also regarding the migration and the wintering here in Brazil, as you can see, the this it, each one of these points represent one individual purple marking that has been tracked to during the migration to Brazil. And as you can see, we have a different amount of data for each subspecies. And now I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about this difference, primarily about uh, the migration, the migratory studies and the regions that they occur here in Brazil. We already talked about the Western. <laughs> So now I'm going to talk about the eastern and the desert. So the eastern purple martin is the most studied, primarily because the its breeding behavior that depends almost exclusively of artificial nests that are provided by common people like everybody not everybody but thousands of people in west in the east of the u.s and canada that put these little houses in their gardens and because of that the eastern purple martin is easily handling handily and we can access them more easily and there are several of studies that monitor their breeding, their behavior, and were able to, to put tags on them like GPSs and geolocators and track their migration. And an in interesting pattern that it's that it was observed and it wasn't break yet, it's that all the birds, all, all the individuals that were tracked to during their migrations uh over winter over winter in amazon amazon is this region in south america where most of it it's in brazil it's a biome uh there is characteriz characterized by huge rivers and dense forests and lots as you can see here lots of birds were tracked to amazon here it's an animation with uh, the movement of four birds that were that were equipped with GPSs from PMCA in in Erie, Pennsylvania, and travel to Amazon, and we can observe the movement in two during the migration and the daily movements that they took here in Brazil. Uh, the the animation finished only with two individuals because the berry died. Uh, during the wintering. An interesting fact about the daily movements about purple martins here in Amazon is that Amazon has two types of rivers. They, ha it, they have uh, the black water rivers and the white water rivers. They have this different, they have lots of different char characteristics like the Blackwater River, where, where the purple martin roost uh, has a, a low concentration of nutrients. And because of that, and also a very acid water, and because of that, there's no insects there. So where the purple martins live, there's no insects. And during the day, they travel between 30 to 100 kilometers to feed themselves in white water rivers where the there's a lot of nutrients and consequently a lot of insects uh, so it's a very attractive 
place to a purple marking be to to feed. Um, we still don't know why they sleep, the why they roost in Blackwater rivers, but it's a pattern that has been observed for every bird that we track to Amazon. And also because the Amazon uh, has, showed, has shown to be a very important place to purple martins due to the researchers and studies of the Eastern Purple Martin, it was the first place that our project conduct a field work. Uh, in 2019, we found this roost in this tiny island, and we we were able to conduct field work there during three years, um, minus 2021 due to the pandemic. And it's a huge roost. I'm going to show you a video to you guys, but we were able to be there. And because of this island is floated by the water, the canops of the trees stay close to the water level and we we're able to capture them easily and because it's a lot of birds we we're able to capture like hundreds of birds each year that we've been there and we also abandoned them we captured two banded birds from connecticut um it was a pretty pretty amazing field to work there this is the roost. I mean, it's about 300 uh, and thousands of birds. And they perform this choreography when they start to dive in, in, the, in the island. And every, every afternoon around 4 p.m., 4.30, they start to gather around the island and when you can't count anymore, they started to dive into the island. There is also a peregrine falcon that came to play this antagonistic role. It's a it's a, a very incredible phenomenon. If you if you guys had the opportunity to be in Amazon during February and March, uh, I highly recommend it that if you try to take this tour. Now the third subspecies and the last known, <laughs> the last study, but we're uh, changing this together with the Tucson Audubon Society, the Purple Martin Conservation Association, and the Northern Arizona University. We start the Desert Purple Martin Project in 2022 to try to understand uh, more about the conservation of the species. It's a, such a, an enigmatic subspecies since, since it has a, so, such a different behavior. They, they nest in cavities of cactus, which turns more difficult, even more difficult to, to capture them. And the they breeding distribution is in the Sonoran Desert which is a desert that occurs in the south of Arizona in California, the Sonora State, Baja California, in Baja California Sur uh, in Mexico. And until last year, we didn't have any information about the migration of this bird, but this changed and we hope, hopefully we'll get more information about it. So this is the environment that the desert purple martin breed in Tucson, close to Tucson, Arizona. Uh, as you can see, it's a very open area. We, the colonies of this purple martin are more similar to the colonies of the, the Western purple martin because they are less colonial, so they are more dispersed in the environment. And from 2022, we start to conduct some field work leading by the Tucson Audubon. And as similar to the work that we did in Spirito Santo, we, we use this mist net in this telescopic pose. But here was uh, very difficult to capture them because they are great flyers 
and they can see very well during the during the flight because they capture insects. So it was very difficult to capture them here. And besides the field work, we do a lot of outreach programs. We develop this virtual exhibition where you can explore the Sonoran Desert to know more about the biology of the desert purple martins. And during the field, we do some, we actually to Son Audubon do nest monitoring uh, to evaluate the productivity of the subspecies. They also organize a, a nest box challenge where when when volunteers design their their box challenge their nest box and now we're we are experiments them uh we place them in, in the desert and hopefully some purple martins will use this this is very important because the sonoran desert uh, face a lot of challenges related to climate change the white fire fires are increasing and this enable the environment to provide uh, cactus old enough to be a, a purple martin nest or woodpecker nest. Um, but a lot of biodiversity use this cactus. So this is an uh, initiative together with others to conserve the environment, but to try to mitigate these problems related to the threats that habitat has been faced. And also we are de deploying some some biologging devices as GPSs and geolocators, and we are able to track the first uh, desert purple martin to from the desert to Brazil. This is a representation of the travel to Northeast Brazil, this region right here, uh, and the travel back. The travel back was quite impressive because it took like from the Amazon to the, to the, to Arizona, it took 15 days. So it traveled really back to breed again. And this is the information that we have right now. We're preparing, uh, the data to show a more fine um, representation of it. And about the breeding regions and the next steps, this we identify two main regions where the, the, this individual of desert purple martin travel. Uh, one of them is this one, the first of them actually is this one between the state of Maranhão in the left and Piauí in the right. Uh, it's also marked by a huge river, this river called Rio Parnaíba, Parnaíba River. And it's in a, a place where the biome or the domain, it's called Cerrado. It's a biome character, characterized by uh, a diversity of types of vegetation since grasslands, some crush, some savanna, and some low high forests. And it's it's a place with where that is facing uh events of the of croplands and agriculture. So it's uh a biome that is in danger here in Brazil. And also as Katinga which is the second region that we identify as important region for this individual of Desert Purple Martin, which were between the state of Ceará and Pernambuco, which also is divided by the huge river called Rio Jaguaribe. And the biome there is the Caatinga, which is very similar with the, the, the landscape that we see in the desert. It's a little less dry, but with the climate change, it's becoming more dry. And it's also being 
threatened by the agriculture. And we want to um, conduct some field work there. So for the next steps, we want to perform an expedition to, to, to study the desert purple martin in the northeastern Brazil. And this is all that I have to present for you. Uh, here is our our social media, our website. I also invite you guys to visit the purplemartin.org, which is the website of Purple Martin Conservation Association that finance a lot of researchers, including mine and everything that I showed you to you guys today. Wow, Clarissa, thank you so much. The work that you and Deanna are doing is just amazing. It, and I think it's always so fascinating to see those connections mm -hmm. from community to community and just really emphasizes the need to work together across borders for the protection of birds. Um, so thank you so much for that. I love the videos too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just seeing that is incredible. Um, I don't, we are very short on time. Um, we have another presenter back to back. Let me just ask you one question to wrap you up for today. Um, how do you think that communities can work? What's the best way for communities to work across borders for the protection of the state of the same species? Like what helps you and Brazil um, in terms of working with others at other locations in other parts of the Western hemisphere where, where purple martins are in terms of benefiting their conservation? Well, uh, for, I mean, for us scientists, we're trying to get these connections through science, science, I mean, but I think for the all communities, uh, local communities in both places, I think sharing their stories and their relationship with the Purple Martins, I mean, everybody has, here in Brazil, everybody has a story about Purple Martins. In Addis, we talked to, well, a lot with older people that talked about observing them when they were a child, so like 50 years ago. And I think sharing their stories, it's uh, a way to make these connections that, that make some human connections beyond the geographic connection that Purple Margins are made. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I would really love to get down there. I'm sure everybody now wants to go to Brazil and see them as they come back to roost. So yeah, really I came. <laughs> <laughs> kind of plan that trip now. Yes. So, th thanks again, Clarissa. And for those of you out there who are like, wait, I had a question to ask. If you want to send those to us, please do. We'll reach out to Clarissa and Deanna and get you those answers and put them up and um, hopefully help to answer any any burning questions you might have. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Miguel to introduce our next speaker. Thanks so much, Miguel. Thank you, Clarissa. I love your Purple Martin work. We are so happy to learn more from the species. And now we will switch to Spanish because we are happy to have a Dr. Kelvin Guerrero here who will uh, share her experience uh, with entomology in Dominican Republic, where we will have present this year for the Beers Caribbean Conference during the summer. Thank you for joining us for World Migratory Bird Day Live. We want to take a moment to honor and express our gratitude to our World Migratory Bird Day supporters. Your commitment and support are crucial to the success of migratory bird conservation. A special thank you to our global flyway partners, the U.S. Forest Service and National Park Service. We are truly grateful to our American flyway partners, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, Optics for the Tropics, and Partners in Flight. Your dedication to conservation and education in protecting migratory birds is invaluable. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you to our program partners, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, Pepco Holdings, Avian Powerline, Songbird Essentials, the U.S. Department of Defense, and Vortex Optics for their partnership and support. 
to our friend level sponsors, Birds Caribbean, Nature Canada, Birds Canada, and Canabio. Your support is appreciated in achieving our goals of fostering community and conservation across borders. Lastly, Environment for the Americas is grateful to all of our members, donors, supporters, and World Migratory Bird Day event organizers. Your contributions are helping to create a more connected and conscientious world. And to you, our audience, thank you for watching and supporting migratory bird conservation. You can further support our campaign by visiting migratorybirdday.org or by donating to Environment for the Americas at environmentamericas.org. Thank you for watching World Migratory Bird Day Live. Thank you, Dr. Guerrero, for estar acá y bienvenido para eh, escuchar todas sus experiencias. Welcome, Dr. Guerrero. We're quite happy to hear from you. Thank you for your time. Go ahead and share your screen right now and start. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. I am going to share my screen. Can you see it now? It's getting started. Now you need to, there it is. Place it in full screen. Can you see it now? Okay, exactamente. Okay, perfect. All right. When I was contacted, I was told to prepare a presentation on the importance of birds and insects. So I thought of this title, Insects, the largest biomass food source for birds is threatened. So here I am going to information of some very basic calculations that I put together. There's been a series of studies, you know, through bibliographical information um, in order to reach to some statistic data. What I did was produce some basic calculations with those robust numbers that we have received. And even though this may not be uh, information that you find it in writing, what I want to do with it is to share the great amount of insects that exists in comparison with other uh, birds and other species. Let's get started. Here we have, there is about 1 million of insects. So here we have basic numbers of other species. As you may know, most of the insects that exist are not just for the nutrients for birds, but also for other insects, for mollusks, reptiles, and many other species, mainly bats, you know? So it's not just biome for one species or a series of species of, you know, just birds, but many others. So this is the chain, uh, the nutrient chain that we can see. And we're going to focus on this specific direct relationship with birds. As you can see here, as part of the calculations that I put together, um, for example, I have here that there are in the world about from 900,000 to 1 million. And I put an average of this and we have about between 9,500 to 11,000 11, um, species. And we have about 10 million species of insects, which compared to the 18,000 species of birds. So the calculation I put together by dividing this, we have you know, estimating from the amount of species in insects and the amount of species in birds, we have about 92 species of insects for each species of bird. So 
we have already a difference right there. The other thing that we have on this part over here, uh, let's say, even the density of birds that exist, the biomass, or the biome, when I was calculating this, this is what I came up with. We have about 0. 0.00000005 birds per insect. And this means vice versa, that there are 200 million insects per bird in the planet. And what is it that I want to show here? In the case of the birds, on a global scale, per person, we have six birds per person. When it comes to the insects, we have about, in the reference, we have that in a total in the world, we have 10, you have 18 zeros to the right of birds that exist, zillions of times it's called. Some of them are thinking about even 428 billion because it's, they're not counting to those 50 billions. All these other birds that have to do with farms and farm activities. And this is something interesting that many of these birds that add up to this number are either focused in some species that have great abundance, when in comparison, there isn't that many or that much abundance in other species. You know, the populations of each, you know, the rare birds, for example, they basically arrive to about 5,000, you know, samples of them or uh, presence of them, these rare birds. So again, I want to point out here, I use the terrestrial the terrestrial, we have 29% of the planet, um, which is, you know, the terrestrial part of the planet. Um, I don't really have data about the insects on the water areas. So right now, our population as human, it's 8.2 billion. This is something that I access through a portal that tells you how many people are being born per second. So we have about 54 people per kilometer, square kilometer. And we have 335 birds per square mile per square kilometer. And we have 67 billion of insects per square kilometer. So this is the calculation of biomass that I am calculating. As I'm saying, insects are a biomass, both in numbers and in terms of the sustainment that they bring is because they their biomass is so big because they sustain an enormous amount of species. Again, this data was transformed with the Española Island, Dominican Republic and Haiti. Given the data in 2022, we have 318 vertebrate species registered. And in 2020, only the insects, there was an inventory made and we have 6,784 species of insects in the island, meaning that in this island, we have 21 species of insects per species of birds. De esas especies de insecto, basado en los datos anteriores que, que conseguí, ahí tenemos eh, la gráfica de esos insectos y de los órdenes por, por su porcentaje y número de especies que tenemos en la isla de la Española, eh, con la referencia bibliográfica de Pérez de la Verde. Entonces, igualmente, con una regla elemental de cálculo, la regla de tres, yo traduje eh, los, los, los datos globales, los, eh, los cálculos globales, las cantidades globales, lo 
polarice para la isla. Nuestra isla tiene 76 y pico de kilómetro cuadrado, por lo cuando hice el cálculo, eh, utilizando la regla del tren, eso significa que nosotros tendríamos 25 mil y pico de aves, 25 mil 578 aves por kilómetro cuadrado, mientras que de insectos tendríamos 34 346, eh, 34 millones 346 mil 831 insectos por kilómetro cuadrado. O sea, esa cantidad de, 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 de insectos es para alimentar, garantizar la alimentación de esa cantidad de ave que se encuentra. Recuérdense que eso es en términos de individuo, no de especie. Ahora, eh, Martin Mifeller, de la Universidad de Basilea, hizo una estimación que las aves consumen casi entre 400 y 500 millones de toneladas métricas de escarabajo mosca, hormigas, polillas y pulgones, o sea, diferentes órdenes de insectos y otros artrópodos, ¿ok? Y que solamente en un bosque tropical, ¿eh? Estas consumen el 75%, que viene siendo, se traduce a unos 300 millones de toneladas, de insectos que se localizan en ese bosque, ¿ok? Entonces, hay algo muy importante. Estas aves eh, son más activas, especialmente durante la temporada de cría, que necesitan eh, presas ricas en proteína para alimentar a su cría y para ellas reproducirse. O sea, que eh, esa fenología de que a veces los insectos son abundantes, eh, viene en la fenología que las plantas echan flores y son abundantes en épocas que coinciden con la misma reproducción de las aves. Y aquí están unos datos de la advertencia de los científicos con respecto a, a, a la extinción de insectos eh, eh, en el mundo. Se dice que en el mundo se ha perdido entre el 5% al 10% de todas las especies de insectos en los últimos 150 años, ¿ok? Para que puedan ver. Y se estima que la población de insectos está disminuyendo a un ritmo de 2% anual, ¿ok? Y algo muy importante... Aparte de las aves, ¿eh? que tienen que alimentar y otros vertebrados, los, los insectos son los eh, polinizadores de muchos cultivos, que el 75% de los cultivos en el mundo son polinizados por insectos, que eso está valorado, ese servicio ecosistémico, ese servicio ecosistémico de la polinización en 570 mil millones de dólares al año, según IBES. ¿okay? Fíjese qué interesante esto. ¿Eh? Y hay algo muy importante. Mucha gente está tomando como referencia la reducción de la cantidad de insectos a que iban a la luz antes y que te chocaban en el vidrio y actualmente con la luz alta y eso, y, y lo, los insectos no te chocan en el vidrio, sobre todo cuando tú vas en una zona boscosa, que antes ensuciaban todo el vidrio del carro, el windshield. ¿Ok? Causas principales de esta desaparición, deforestación. Pesticidas, ya algunos expositores han mencionado algunos, contaminación lumínica. Hay gente que se está focalizando mucho en la, en la pesticida y en la contaminación eh, y, y en la deforestación, pero hay algo que también está causando mucha, eh, mucho, eh, eh, contribuyendo a la desaparición de insectos, que es la contaminación lumínica. Algo muy importante, eh, yo hago muestreo. Yo hago un muestreo de murciélagos en la noche aquí en el país y he visto que la mayoría de los murciélagos están yendo a las luces de los postes de luz en la calle más que en el bosque. Eso es grave porque entonces esos insectos no están yendo a esas plantas que son de hábito nocturno, que florecen de turno, los polinizadores nocturnos como la polilla y eso, y otros insectos no están yendo a polinizar. Entonces también puede haber una debilidad ahí en la... En, en, en la el rol funcional en la biodiversidad de estas especies fue a través de la contaminación de lumínica. Cambio climático, eso lo sabemos todos, incendios forestales, y para mí esto es uno de los más graves porque lo he visto en nuestro país. Los incendios forestales, cuando un ave está poniendo huevo y cuando un insecto está en larva, está en huevo, que lo ponen en las plantas hospederas y tienen su nido, esos no, los huevos no pueden correr, tampoco la larva. Bien, entonces... Eso te consume una población de insectos que a lo mejor en ese momento se están reproduciendo, pero que se encuentran en estado larvario, en estado de pichones o en estado de huevo, y realmente el, el incendio elimina 
toda eh, 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 esa etapa de desarrollo que eventualmente se van a traducir en menos adulto eh, eh, en el ecosistema, que eso también contribuye. Para mí es uno de, lo, de, de los impactos más, más críticos, eso, de, de, lo, de los impactos, ay, perdón, de los impactos más, eh, más críticos de, de eso. Y ya esa los pusieron adelante ya, esa cosa que lo están diciendo. Algo muy importante también, aquí a la derecha tenemos lo, los diferentes servicios ecosistémicos que se pueden perder por la desaparición de insectos. Biomasa que la necesitan los animales insectívoros, incluyendo las aves. ¿Ok? Diferencia de especie en, en el tiempo, espacio en el tiempo. Es decir, hay insectos que se, se desarrollan en el otoño, en el verano, en la primavera, y eso, como son muchos, se van eh, 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 se van restableciendo en diferentes época, épocas. Y hay algo muy importante, ya yo había hablado de lo de la diversidad funcional, y hay algo muy importante, la coextinción. Si un ave desaparece, ¿eh? igualmente con las aves, van a desaparecer otros insectos que son endoparásitos, o básicamente estos parásitos de esa ave, o sea, parásito externo. Y a veces hay parásitos que son muy específicos de una especie. Es como los polinizadores con la orquídea. Si desaparece una or orquídea que tiene un un polinizador altamente eh, especializado, eventualmente ese polinizador se va a desaparecer. Finalmente, y espero que no haya ido hablando muy rápido, sobre todo en español para el público de habla inglesa, ok, finalmente, aquí le dejo una reflexión final, ok, después de haber escuchado esta presentación, ¿cuál será la actitud de estos de los que me están escuchando, con respeto a los insectos, para garantizar la seguridad alimentaria de las aves. Es como le digo a los amigos míos que son observadores de aves, ¿ok? Si yo fuera observador de aves, propiciara la conservación más de insectos, porque sé que voy a garantizar la seguridad alimentaria de las aves, y eso me va a dar la oportunidad de yo poder observar más aves en el futuro. Muchas gracias. Cualquier pregunta, me dejan saber. ¿Están ahí? ¿Ay? Hoy, Kelvin. Muy ¿Me duplicado. escuchan? Sí. Ah, estoy hablando portugués. Hoy, hola. hola sí. Muchas gracias. Pues... Pensaba que estaba solo y dije, wow, me quedé como el llanero solitario. No, estamos aquí. Ok, bueno, eso fue lo que preparé. Lamento que me tenga que ir tan rápido porque es que tengo otra, eh, tenemos unos talleres, yo soy un autor para la evaluación de los ecosistemas del, de dominicano que estamos haciendo eh, y, y, y soy parte de los autores para la evaluación y el análisis de los ecosistemas. De hecho, para tratar mucho de esos temas de deforestación, incendios forestales, de degradación de ecosistemas, contaminación y eso, y trazar de estrategia y política para conservación lo poco que nos queda. No, muchas gracias por su tiempo, doctor Guerrero. Yo sé que está, ah, estamos un poco retrasados, pero agradecemos todo el conocimiento que compartió con nosotros y sobre todo queremos eh, cerrar con una única pregunta. Este año estamos celebrando Protege los Insectos, Protege las Aves. Muy conciso, ¿qué acción recomendaría a usted, a nuestros educadores y a nuestros educadores en escuela en todo el continente para iniciar en la protección de los insectos? Ok, eh, la primera cosa yo encuentro que son los pesticidas, ¿ok? Eh, los pesticidas es lo más grave. Los incendios eh, forestales algunas veces son intencionales, otras veces son naturales y a veces escapan de nuestra mano, pero yo creo que lo primordial es los lo pesticidas, sobre todo aquellos pesticidas que son sistemáticos, es, es, sistémicos, perdón, eh, que eh, eh, es, eh, se lo comen las aves, las aves hacen la, eh, matan el insecto, pero a veces come ese insecto muerto, pero también contamina las aves, y cuando llega un, un nivel alto de pesticidas, se mueren las aves, porque ya su organismo no resiste más. Eso es una. 
Eh, la otra cosa que entiendo que pueden salvar insectos, y eso en Estados Unidos está muy claro, es haciendo como fincas de polinizadores. Es decir, en, como en áreas agrícolas, que a lo mejor tú puedas tirar pesticidas y control de plaga, porque eso es entendible, pero tener como área de amontiguamiento donde tenga zonas de polinizadores que atraigan insectos, que atraigan insectos y pueda mantener como una población local, porque tam, no solamente te contribuye con la conservación de las aves, su alimentación, sino también con la planta que, que, que requieren de la polinización para echar el fruto. Algo muy importante que, que, no, que, no destaque, que quise destacar es que directamente lo que, los datos que presenté de biomasa, de la cantidad de, de, de insectos que se comen aves, pero recuérdense también que algunos frutos silvestres que no son alimentos de los humanos son polinizados por los insectos. O sea que hay también una alimentación directa a través de la funcionalidad de la, eh, del servicio ecosistema de, de, de la polinización de las plantas, de las cuales algunas aves eh, que son vegetarianas se alimentan de los frutos que necesariamente tienen que estar polinizados por un insecto, ¿ok? Sí. Bueno, no, muchas gracias, excelentes recomendaciones y bueno, hasta aquí dejamos entonces el Vivir Day Live, agradecemos a todos los que se conectaron esta tarde, los esperamos mañana para seguir las conexiones y las actividades, entonces hasta luego muchas gracias. Hasta luego y muchas todos. gracias por la oportunidad Thank you for joining us for World Migratory Bird Day Live. We want to take a moment to honor and express our gratitude to our World Migratory Bird Day supporters. Your commitment and support are crucial to the success of migratory bird conservation. A special thank you to our global flyway partners, the U.S. Forest Service and National Park Service. We are truly grateful to our American Flyway partners, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Land Management, Optics for the Tropics, and Partners in Flight. Your dedication to conservation and education in protecting migratory birds is invaluable. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you to our program partners, the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation, Pepco Holdings, Avian Powerline, Songbird Essentials, the U.S. Department of Defense, and Vortex Optics for their partnership and support. To our friend level sponsors, Birds Caribbean, Nature Canada, Birds Canada, and Canabio, your support is appreciated in achieving our goals of fostering community and conservation across borders. Lastly, Environment for the Americas is grateful to all of our members, donors, supporters, and World Migratory Bird Day event organizers. Your contributions are helping to create a more connected and conscientious world. And to you, our audience, thank you for watching and supporting migratory bird conservation. You can further support our campaign by visiting migratorybirdday.org or by donating to Environment for the Americas at environmentamericas.org. Thank you for watching World Migratory Bird Day Live.